Hey, podcast listeners, the Orthodox Center for the Advancement of Biblical Studies is sponsoring its annual Biblical Symposium at St. Elizabeth Orthodox Church in St. Paul, Minnesota, March 8-9, 2019. This year's keynote speaker is Dr. Robert Miller from the Catholic University of America. Meet Father Paul Tarazi and other scholars who will present and discuss papers on biblical exegesis and language. Join Father Mark Bulos and Dr. Richard Benton for a live recording of the Bible as Literature podcast. Engage with others like you who are committed to biblical studies for all who have ears to hear. Register online at ephesusschool.org. Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-c-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. As teachers and students, we delude ourselves with abstraction. How many of us, instead of teaching the words of the Bible, offer a cheap summary or moral extraction to get at what we call the gist of the story? How often have you heard someone talk and talk and talk about God for hours without following the storyline of Scripture in English, let alone the original languages? How often? The King James Bible contains 783,137 words. There is no gist. There are only these words. Everyone, Jesus explains, who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 to 29. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 264 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Last week, we spent some time talking about the question of fruit. What constitutes the fruit of God's instruction? And we challenged the notion that the signs and the wonders in Scripture are themselves the manifestation of the fruit of Scripture. The true fruit of the commandment is the actions prescribed by the commandment. We can consider these actions fruit because if you trust the commandment and you do what it says, you trust that it will achieve what it wants to achieve through those actions. We have to distrust our heart's desire. It's not about us and what we want to do. In the last passage, they said, we did these wonderful actions in your name. Well, maybe they did it in his name, but they didn't do it according to his commandment. And this makes all the difference. Just because you do an action and you say, oh, I did this in the name of Jesus, doesn't necessarily mean it was done according to Jesus's will. There's one will that's allowed, and that's God's will. We are not allowed to act according to our own will, only according to the Lord's will. And the only way we know that we are acting correctly is if our will is subsumed by that will. So we have to ignore what we desire on our own in order to do only what the Lord wants. The fruit is of obedience. We have to act obediently. We can't do the right thing because we decided it was the right thing. We do the right thing because Scripture decided it was the right thing. That's the only way we can function. That's the only fruit that's acceptable. If we do the right thing because we think it's right, that is the path towards self-righteousness. And we're coming now with this section, Richard, to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which began with the Beatitudes, a lengthy sermon given to supplant our righteousness, our self-righteousness, our self-directed sense of correctness, 
to replace and supplant that with the commandment that produces its fruit. And that fruit is the actions we take through our submission to the commandment. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Typically, when people talk about wisdom and someone being wise, they think about it in terms of the individual's experience, their knowledge, their abilities, because that's how we assess things as human beings. We respect people who have experience and knowledge and ability. But here in verse 24, somebody is wise when they act the way Scripture tells them to act. This is a really important point because Scripture offers you a shortcut to wisdom. It gives you the behaviors of a wise man for you to simply model before you yourself become wise. You are not wise, but Scripture, through your obedience to its instruction, makes you act like someone who is wise. Now, if you're practical, you know that someone who acts wise, whose actions are wise, is wise irrespective of what you think is going on inside of them. Here, the famous example from computer science of the Turing test for artificial intelligence is highly functional. If a computer interacts with you like another person and you can't tell that it's a computer, then by the Turing standard, that computer is intelligent. Now, the funny thing about obedience in Scripture is that when you act out the actions of a wise man according to Scripture's definition of wisdom, through your obedience and the repeated actions that your obedience to Scripture produce in you, you will become wise. Your actions will teach you. We've covered this before on the podcast. We imagine that everything begins with an idea. Scripture is flipping it around. Everything begins with the action. Don't ask whether you love your wife. Begin your day by hugging your wife and greeting her with a kind word. Do it every day and everything else will fall in place. The only way you became a master at painting in the 18th century is you had a master. And your first job would be to fetch their paints and watch them as they mix their paints. The next thing you would do is you would copy their paintings. They would give you a painting that they painted and you would have to copy it. And they would critique you on whether you copied it faithfully to the original. And as soon as you could consistently and faithfully imitate precisely the strokes and the colors of your master, then you could be an artist. These words that Jesus teaches are those strokes and colors. If you want to be a master of this teaching, you must be a student of this teaching. So you begin with the words. Now, I've heard a lot of times people saying you need to know about the Bible. You need to know Bible stories. No, you need to know the words of the Bible. Historically, human beings would go into the church, and in the church someone would read aloud the words, and you would listen to those words, and you would memorize those words. And back then, people were much better at memorizing. They could memorize a whole text after hearing it once or twice. So the first test would be, can you repeat the words? In the same way, when my kids were little, did you hear what I was saying? Yes. Okay, tell me back what I just told you. Well, you said this. Okay, now I know that you heard me. Now we can talk about what I said. But we can't move on in the conversation until I know that the words that I said penetrated your skull. This is what Jesus is saying. You must know these words first. The problem with the previous scene in the last verse was that the people wanted the miracles and the wonders to come first, and then they could deal with the words. No, the only actions that are valid are the ones that proceed from these words. But the words are the foundation to everything. Rich, you know that at St. Elizabeth, I'm now teaching all of the youth, and by all of the youth, I mean everyone ranging from kids who don't know how to read yet all the way up to high school. We all have one class on Sundays, 
and the classes memorizing Galatians. They all sit together, and all of them are challenged to recite by memory each verse of Galatians. And as we go through, I take the opportunity to explain words, to tell them about the original Greek terms, to talk about other areas of education, like proper pronunciation and English grammar and the history of language. We're doing all of this simply by memorizing Galatians. But the key is that all of the kids, even the kids who cannot yet read, are able to hear and repeat and memorize. This is the foundation you build through instruction. This is what real church school is all about. You could sit there and talk about what you think about Galatians, or we could learn Galatians from the least to the greatest. Then you're building something on a foundation that's solid, which is what Matthew is talking about in verse 24. People think that the story has to be told on a level where the kids can get it. And only if it's told on a level that they can get it, then can you move on. But this is absolutely not true. And here's how I know that's not true. Because in church, for the adults, we read the scripture and the adults don't get it. Does that mean we stop reading or that we simplify or that we edit the text so that the adults can get it? By no means. You have everybody memorize it, whether they're three and they can't read, or whether they're 70 with a PhD. You still have everybody memorize the words because nobody gets the words. You take the words in first, but it might take more than a lifetime before you actually understand them. The point is to plant that seed of the word so that the correct actions can come out. And the actions may come out little by little, even if every single one of the words is not understood, every human will understand according to their ability, but they must take those words in. Each child, in being forced to memorize every word on the page precisely, is learning Galatians. They are learning the content of Galatians. They are paying attention to every detail. It doesn't matter whether or not they've formulated a gist in their head. In fact, it's better that they don't, because if they want to answer the call of Matthew chapter 7, they don't need the gist of the Sermon on the Mount or the gist of Galatians. They need to know the content of the text. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Wisdom comes through practice, and Scripture is giving us the words to practice saying and the actions to continually practice doing. This is the Alpha and the Omega of wisdom. To say something wise precisely, and then to do what that wisdom prescribes precisely. That is the solid foundation that cannot be disturbed by the things that come and go in life. It's those words that are the foundation. If your actions are founded in those words, they can't go wrong. That's the problem with the previous scene. When they performed the wondrous acts in Jesus' name, there was no foundation other than their human ego. I thought this was a good idea. Well, what made you think it was a good idea? I don't know. Okay, well, it doesn't sound like there's a very good premise there. But if the words of Scripture are the premise, then there's nothing that can undermine the actions. The actions are essential. The fruit is what counts. But unless the root, the foundation, is these words that Jesus has been teaching, then uh, you don't know. You need this foundation. You need this to be solid, and then you can move on. But it's the wise man. It's the understanding man. How do you know that he's wise or understanding? Because he knows these words. You can test him. The words of Jesus' sermon are the foundation, not the ideas, not the notions, not the theology, the words that Jesus taught. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. That gist you're trying to give your church school students, or that beautiful summary from the children's Bible that you think was so meaningful, is useless. It's better for a child to memorize exactly what Paul said or exactly what Jesus said here in Matthew. I challenge all of our listeners, teach your children to recite the Sermon on the Mount by memory. 
teach them to recite the Psalms by memory. Have them memorize Galatians. We chose Galatians for the church school class at St. Elizabeth because if you know Galatians, you know Scripture. Teach something. To teach actually means to teach something, not to pontificate. So my children did memorize the Sermon on the Mount when they were little. My wife taught them over many, many days, many weeks. For the person who doesn't know these words, they think of what prayer is. They think of what prayer looks like in a painting. They think of the feeling of prayer. They think about what it feels like when they pray. This is the foolish man, because if you're not building from the words of Scripture, you're building from something else. That's the sand. Some feelings and some notions. That's what you're building your understanding of prayer on, and that's what your actions of prayer are built upon. But when my kids learned the Sermon on the Mount and didn't have experience with prayer outside of it, then for them, prayer means do it in secret. Prayer means our Father. Prayer means don't pray for the things that God already knows you need. When my kids would talk about prayer, they could talk about prayer more logically than many adults could. Because adults, when they talked about prayer, they would talk about prayer in general. But the prayer in general is founded precisely on the sand that Jesus is talking about. Whereas when my children, even when they were children, because their experience, so to speak, of prayer was only these words that Jesus was teaching in the sermon, they were solid when they talked about prayer. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell and great was its fall. The emphasis on the magnitude of the fall is important because building up a house on lies is like building a bubble in your economy. First it was the dot-com bubble, then it was the housing bubble, puffed up on falsehoods. So if you build a house with your words, and as a human you want to build something great and glorious, it's going to be a great and glorious lie, and when it falls, the fall will be great. Scripture, interestingly, if you obey it, puts you at a level lower than that to which someone would fall. You can't fall from the bottom. It's like in Luke. If you come and you sit at the front, the master could put you to the back of the feast. But if you take the worst seat in the house, there's always a chance that he can bring you to the seat of honor in the front. So, of course, it's going to be a great fall, because at the end of the day, when you speak words, you speak words to honor yourself. Yes, you're honoring yourself. That's the point. You're honoring your ego. I think it's beautiful that these are the last words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, because it expresses the results of acting according to your own ego, acting according to your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own, your not his words. It's not about obedience. It bookends beautifully the Beatitudes in the beginning because he describes all people with the smallest of egos, the poor, those who mourn, the meek, the hungry and the thirsty, those who are merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, persecuted for righteousness sake, those who are reviled. Those are the people whose ego has been deflated. The ones who act according to their own words are those with an ego greatly inflated. Did you hear what Jesus had to say? Did you? Let me hear what he had to say. And now it's time for you to recite the words. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. This section of Matthew is very specific. Listen to the text. Which words? These words. And again, verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine. And again, in verse 28, when the crowd had finished these words, he's not talking about the gist of what he's saying. He's talking about what is written in this text. Matthew is saying you are accountable to what is written here, these words. And the authority with which he speaks is the authority of these words. If you say exactly these words, the words that you form with your lips carry the same authority that Jesus is exercising here. The reason the scribes don't have authority is because as scribes, 
they themselves, who are professional copyists, are not being faithful to the content written here in these words. Jesus' words are even more important than Jesus. It's these words that are most important. Jesus dies, and then Jesus is resurrected, and Jesus sits at the right hand. But what do the disciples carry with them? These words. What words do we have? These words. And what words do we read? These words. This is what we have. It's these words. We're not going to talk about John, but even John says in the beginning was the word. It's the word that comes first. It's the word that comes from Jesus' mouth that is even more important than Jesus himself. It's not a relationship to Jesus that we need to have. It's a relationship to Jesus' words that we need to have. It's not Jesus that we need to have in our heart. It's Jesus' words we need to have in our heart. It's not what would Jesus do. It's what did Jesus say. It's the word that matters. You have to have those words in your heart for any of this to matter. That's why when people want to study patristics, when people want to study the fathers, I always say you have to have a mastery of what they're discussing before you're going to understand what they say. How can you understand what St. John Chrysostom is talking about if you don't know Bible? Because he's talking about the Bible. He's expounding on the Bible. He's assuming you just listened to the gospel reading before he started talking. You have to know these words. By knowing these words, I want to be clear, we mean familiarity up to and including memorization. There's nothing better than practice and repetition for anything in life. At the end of the day, what you do is what you are. You are defined by the way you function, and Scripture is commanding you to function in a specific way. And if you function in obedience to the words of Jesus written here, these words, if you function in obedience to these words, you produce the fruit that God the Father is willing you to produce through the instruction he gave to his son to pour into your ear. Look, when my kids make brownies, I buy the brownie mix, I buy the oil, I buy the eggs, I buy the mixer, I buy the pans, I buy the oven. They take the ingredients, they put them together, and they say, look, we made brownies. Thank you very much. I'll enjoy the brownies. It's only because you used my ingredients, my oven, and my electricity to do so. But I offer you these raw materials so you can make something out of it. Jesus offers us these words so that we can make something out of it. And heaven forbid your children try to make soup with brownie ingredients. I just hope (laughs) they don't try to go out of their ego to think of some idea of brownies that they imagined and try to feed that to me, because I don't know how delicious that would be. Just follow the word on the box, and all the brownies will be well with us. (laughs) Thanks, Dr. Benton. Have a great week. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.